Hello Virtual Doll Convention. It's Rachel and I am here with Christina and we are here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art for the Little Ladies Exhibit that is happening right now. The Philadelphia Museum of Art has invited us in for this exclusive opportunity. You guys, the museum is closed right now. This is special just for us. Christina, you have been working so hard on this exhibit. It's about to close on March 2nd, but it has People around the world have been telling us how wonderful it is. Why did you do this exhibit? Well, the, the dolls are really special. They really form a, a miniature time capsule of Victorian life, the ideal fashionable woman, which of course was an ideal, but still it really allows us to see in miniature and in exquisite detail just how, how um, complete the, you know, how the dolls represent what a fashionable woman should be and all of the different roles. And then it really ties into Victorian etiquette as well and the proper role of women and just how the Victorians thought. So I think it's a great opportunity to really get to look at that in depth. It's an incredible opportunity. We are so excited to be here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get behind the camera and we are going to travel with Christina through the exhibit. Christina, you are the curator of textiles and, and other things. What do you handle here at the museum? Uh, my title is the Levine Associate Curator of Costume and Textiles and Supervising Curator for the Study Room. So we cover all um, ages and all around the world. We have about 30,000 costume and textile objects. So this is just one tiny aspect, but all of the things here are from our collection. So it's a pleasure to show oh, them off. Great, that was one of the questions a lot of our viewers had when we announced this is, where did they all come from? These are yours. They are. How extraordinary. They all came from different donors. One came in in 1922 and three in the 1970s. And then we just got one in this year, just a couple months before the exhibition opened that I was able to slip in, but they are all now part of our permanent collection. Oh, fantastic. Well, we love that. So we are here right now in the beginning and take us away. All right, well, this is a little introductory part which features full size um, dress. Uh, so this is called the Dictates of Fashion and it really introduces uh, visitors to what was going on after the Civil War. So in the late 1860s and early 1870s, the Gilded Age was a time when more and more Americans could participate in fashion. There was more wealth and there was more desire to know what was going on. So this is a period when etiquette books proliferated. So I have a case of etiquette books here that advised women who weren't quite sure what to do all of the, the things that they needed to know, the etiquette of calling, for example, which was a very important social ritual, and then looks at the importance of feminine dress in the period. So there are two full-size um, costumes, again, from our collection, this beautiful American day dress from about 1870, with all of the trim that's now possible with the sewing machine coming into full usage, the aniline dyes, so these really bright colors, and just, you can see how, how decorative and ornamental it was. This is really a period when men and women were thought to have very separate social roles, and many believed that the more distinct the two sexes were in their roles, the more refined a civilization was. So they really saw it as a reflection of an advance in civilization. Men should be um, busy with politics and the world and business. Women should be responsible for the home and family. And indeed, at the time, it was said that the role of women was to please, to adorn, and to refine. So you can really see that when we get into the dolls, just how they reflect this. But this beautiful day dress here with all of the ornaments, um, it's right at that transition period between the hoop skirt and the bustle period. Um, beautiful um, dressmaker detailing on, on it. And then if we turn to the other dress that's on view, this is by one, uh, the, the acknowledged father of haute couture, so-called Charles Frederick Worth, who was an Englishman who worked in Paris. And he was the first um, fashion designer to really have a known name. And all the Americans who could possibly afford it, and it was incredibly expensive, went to Paris to buy Worth garments if they could. So this is one of our Worths. This is an early Worth from about uh, the late 1860s when he was in partnership with a Swedish businessman, Otto Boborg. And it's for a very young girl, typically for um, Worth dresses of the time. It's this very large skirt, but it has two bodices. This is the evening bodice that's shown here. And then it also has either a day or a dinner bodice. So you could get more usage out of all those yards of fabric in the skirt. But here, Worth is really working um, for a, a young ingenue. It's not terribly fussy, although there's a lot of detailing. You can see some of the 18th century details that were also popular, like the faux overskirt and so forth. So this is a period, uh, the Gilded Age, when 
there's starting to be a lot of thought about how women should dress. Books like the one in the case here called um, Art in Ornament and Dress were published that talked about how you should have harmonies in color and dress and gave you um, tips for, for satisfactory color combinations and looked at all of these things. So it was really thought that women's clothes were an artistic form of, of expression at this period. So that made clothes very important. Uh, and that's kind of the prologue to the rest of the exhibition. We then turn to this little figure of a girl here who's wearing a dress also from about 1867, 68, um, uh, from our collection, and look at how girls were, were educated and what their role was thought to be. Of course, girls, girls' education was very different from boys' education at this time because both of them were being trained to assume very different roles in society. So she's got a dress that mimics um, all of the features of an adult woman's garment, but with a shorter skirt. She would have had a hoop skirt underneath it at the time, and all of the other features, the, the trim and the dagging and so forth, are very fashionable for women's clothes. So it's kind of a miniature version of a women's dress with a shortened skirt. And of course, education for girls was also very different from that for boys. It was really thought that they should learn how to become wives and mothers, which was their expected role. And dolls were considered to be of primary importance in female education. I have a quote on the wall here um, that's Godey's Magazine from 1869, quoting Victor Hugo in Les Miserables, that says, uh, a little girl without a doll is nearly as unhappy and quite as impossible as a wife without children. So that really sums up the role of dolls yes. at the time. Yes, there's a lot of men and women who are watching this right now that f feel like that today. I can tell you, <laughs> tell you that so much. So yes. dolls of all kinds were important. Obviously, yes. baby dolls were a good way for girls to learn how to do motherly things and take care of them. Making dolls' clothes and washing their little clothes was great training for being a, uh, a housewife later on. But fashion dolls were of particular importance at this period. And the fashion doll is really. Uh, a separate category of dolls that was very popular in the 1860s through until the 1890s or so. Um, so these, this is one here from our collection. Uh, she was named by her owner, Miss Marie Antoinette, although she does have her head still on, I'm happy to say. So these <laughs> dolls were modeled after full-grown women. They weren't baby dolls or little girls, mm -hmm. but full-grown women, except they don't have developed bust lines, so they're, they're flat, uh, flat chested. But other than that, they're full-grown women and their main, um, their main, um, attribute was the amazing clothes and accessories that they have. So um, this, this doll is displayed with a, a, one of the trunks that uh, many of the dolls have uh, that you could fill with all sorts of things. They were very expensive. You can see how beautifully made they mm -hmm. are with the bisque head, the real hair wig, um, the bodies made of various kinds, either this one has um, leather over wood on the upper arms and then bisque lower arms. And then she has uh, sawdust stuffed leather uh, feet and legs and they're joined Remarkable at the knees condition. and the hips. She's, it is, however, she because she is 150 years old, she's got a little bit of uh, maybe arthritis or something. So we can't really unbend her legs the whole way. So we made this little tuffet for her to sit on and be supported. Um, because she's not, she's not able to fully stand up. Well, she, her, she's fantastic. She's doing such a great job. <laughs> <laughs> she is, and she's, she's a little bit taller than the other one. She's about 22 inches high, and the other um, four in our collection are, are more like 18 inches high, but she um, has a number of the same accessories. But just a, an amazing, um, you know, really beautifully Herself, made. If you yes. focus on her little toes, they're in really I was just about to mention condition. the toes. I love the toes. <laughs> and then you, just a, a little bit of a, the variety of, of the clothes that we'll see um, in other contexts later on. But, but uh, very lucky little girls could be given these dolls. Yes. Um, in some cases, we know that a doll was brought back from Paris and given to a, uh, a girl, in, in one case, by her aunt. You could also buy the dolls here, and you could buy all sorts of professionally made accessories as well. There was a whole industry in, in Paris making dolls' clothes, um, so we'll see many of those. Or you could make things at home, and again, that was thought of a great way for a girl to learn um, needlework techniques, or her mother or her aunt or grandmother might make things too. So the dolls, um, have a compilation of different clothes that, that some professionally made, some homemade, and some added in that, that really comprise their whole wardrobe. Has it been fun for you with this exhibit to bring in the doll component? Yes, um, it's it's great um, to know we don't, as a museum, we have a few dolls, but these ones are mainly of interest for our costume and textile department because yes. they do have all of these clothes and, and they really are like miniature versions of grown-ups clothes. So you can oh, really see them. You can see some time differences too. So then we go into the 
um, the sort of thematic section, th these two cases focus on the fashionable wardrobe of women from the late 1860s to the 1870s, and just all of the panoply of things that were needed to be fashionably well-dressed. So this is one of the earlier dated pieces. This obviously would have had a hoop skirt under it, this little blue striped dress. A very full princess dress uh, with the seams, very bold trim. Um, and then you can see some of the other accessories. So these little gloves, for example, everybody, when they look at those, they're just over two inches tall, but they have gussets on the side of each finger. They have points on the back of the hand. You can actually button and unbutton the little button there. And then if you look at the little beaded bag next to it, which is again, just minute, you can twist that little clasp and open and close it. Um, How so it's just the and workmanship is incredible, and the boots are with fabulous those too. On the front. Very oh. fashionable with the oh. with the two tone and the stitching. I would heels. I want heels them. were something that were fairly new in fashion now um, in the late 1860s, oh, because too. women had had not worn heels for for a number of decades, so they were just fairly new. Extraordinary. So they just have everything. You can see an opera cloak trimmed with eider down on the back. Yeah. Um, all different kinds of dresses for every occasion, little shoes, lots of jewelry. Uh, the 1870s uh, was uh, particularly fond of jewelry, lots of crosses and bracelets and beads, combs, tiny earrings. Here's a pair of tiny diamond earrings, um, lots of pocket watches. They were, again, a very fashionable accessory uh, for the time. Lots of bows for the back of the skirt, uh, this basque bow here. Oh, look at that. Undersleeves and the little chemisette, which would fill in a lower neck. Um, sort of like a dicky uh, uh, this time. Right. That, that was an, another um, expected component for a woman's dress. Usually for us in the doll community, the, the clothes by this time that we see them, they've usually completely melted or they're completely <laughs> faded and we didn't, we, we can only use our imaginations to, know, to see what it might have looked like at the time. So it's such a treat to see them in just such glorious condition. This yes. is just some out of, of them, this world. Some of them have somewhere, but our conservation sure. department has done an amazing job of, of bringing them back to life. Absolutely. And then we made these little miniature stands to, to mount everything on um, because we have so many more dresses than we have uh, dolls. But I really wanted everyone to be able to see all of the things here. So um, it's been a lot of, a lot of fun um, mounting them and, and trying to make them all look their best. Absolutely. How long did it take you to um, put put all this together? I know you were doing two exhibitions at the same time, <laughs> That's so right, yeah. you were working double time. <laughs> yes, I was, uh, along with uh, our team. Yes. Um, and so here is another one of the fashion dolls. This is Miss G. Townsend. We know her name because she has visiting cards, but we don't know what her first name was. Um, I dubbed her Geor Georgina, but that's just my imagination. She's dressed for walking, and you can see that that dress is later in style. That's from the later 1870s, so mm. that really covers sort of the period when most of these clothes were made. But she's very fashionably dressed, and again, in a princess walking dress. Um, it looks pieces. like navy. Is that navy? It, it's, it's navy, navy. blue, okay. uh, trimmed with black, and, and, and beautifully done. She's got her bonnet with the bonnet veil, and the little printed handkerchief, little red boots and then she's carrying a little handbag and all of these little coins I think believe they're German coins and the little paper money and the handkerchief were all inside that little handbag so she's fully it. equipped you, you can see some of the other accessories the bonnets, bonnets more gloves wonderful. lorgnettes tiaras brushes of all kinds again little boots with tassels oh the boots the boots are magnificent and they're <laughs> stretchy on the side for yes, girls they have, with big calves they have those elastic sides that were very fashionable the the little um rabbit fur quote unquote ermine um, muff and um, little tippet more um, bonnets um, and clothes of all kinds one of my favorite things here is these little tiny earrings they're not are the they earrings boots. themselves are not <gasps> quite half an inch high i'd say and they are um in the form of little pink high little top boots, pink <laughs> boots. <laughs> oh those are wonderful <laughs> oh i love them how neat and the fan is beautiful too so that they're oh, it really sure just, is. Um, fans are, yeah. are an art just in themselves you they could are. do an exhibit on just on fans if you wanted to we have about 500 in the collection so oh, we certainly amazing. could <laughs> uh, i was reading on wikipedia that that your collection has uh uh, 240,000 uh, artifacts. Is it more museum. than that? Yes. And our department has about 30,000. So That's yeah, amazing. About evenly divided costume and accessories and textiles. So Wonderful. It, there's a lot to choose from. Then the dolls really have all of the underwear that a fashionable woman of the time would need. Um, if you look at this little figure uh, that's dressed with the layers, you can see the corset that's like a full-grown corset, although, of course, because the dolls don't have developed bust lines, it doesn't have the cups for the bust. And a, a full-size 
course it would also open down the center front by this period mm. so this one doesn't it does have a bone but you can see all of the pieces and layers and layers of underwear were required both to protect the outer garments and then to get the correct shape so we start in the back with the chemise um, that is the first garment worn next to the skin absorbs bodily perspiration and soil that goes on and then the drawers which are fairly new um, addition to a respectable woman's wardrobe go on and you can see that they're open crotch so you don't have to take them off when nature calls much more practical the chemise gets sort of bunched up around the hips and and comes out the back of the um, slit in the drawers and then the corset goes on and then over that you could either put a bustle as she's wearing here a horse or a bustle which was slightly later or we also have a hoop skirt here um, that was just like the, the full size version with the, yes. the sprung steel hoops that, and it collapses right down in graduated sizes so it would really support a very full skirt. Um, then you need layers of petticoats so we have several different kinds wool ones for warmth in the winter short ones trained ones etc um, there's a corset cover that could help round out the, the um, bust line because women wanted to have a very full bust very tiny waist and very full hips so all of these pieces really help to get that that look um, and then one very unusual item that we have are these little tiny um, dress shields. These were a fairly new invention. They were, came in in the mid-19th century and they were tacked into dresses to prevent women from ruining a dress when overheated. Um, and indeed, it was a great thing. Because so for the, for the armpits? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> They're called dress shields. I used to work in theatrical costuming and we had a big box at the opera labeled pit pads. Pit pads. And known to the more erudite yes. as dress okay. shields. So, okay. Uh, yes. I was thinking, okay. All right. Yeah. But they, these are very That's new. That's a very refined and way to call it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was what the trade called them. So they, again, they were new and if you tack them in it would prevent um, the perspiration from soaking through and indeed Absolutely. I have to say that, that we have oh, a number of bodices silks. in in the collection that could have benefited from having sure. dress shields in them. So yeah and they still great. have them at they Nordstrom. Do. You can and then them. we also have um, <laughs> stockings and garters. Here's um, little metal clasp garters with the beautifully knit stockings um, displayed Ooh, wow, on a those. miniature chair borrowed from the American Art Department here but just those to, garters. To show off. Aren't they great? Oh they're yeah. fantastic. And then there's also elastic garters over here. Um, so there are a couple different kinds. You can see two different Different versions of the oh, elastic them. garters in the little box that they came in as well. Look at that box. This is just magnificent to see these things in such a glorious condition. What is it about the undergarments that you have always loved? Well, I'm very interested in what, what is considered to be the ideal and how that evolves and how it just becomes a society thinks that their ideal is quote-unquote natural so we think the natural uh, look today is very tall very thin very athletic etc and all of our garments work towards that you know pinch pinch you in keep you nice and your hips right. nice and tight all that kind of thing at the, they had a very different ideal that really emphasized the difference between men and women so they thought men should have broad shoulders and slim hips women should have sloping shoulders and very broad hips uh, so all of these undergarments really helped to achieve that ideal love it it is a treat for us to get to see the the undergarments in this way usually they're hidden by the outfits of the dolls That's and right. and they're so important sometimes the undergarments are better than the dress <laughs> the <laughs> well they the all outfit. have a lot of undergarments so it shows yes. you how important they really were absolutely and then uh, this is another one of our fashion dolls this is um was called by her young owner miss french mary she was brought back um from paris uh, to her three-year-old who obviously didn't play with her until she was a little bit older but she's dressed in a wedding dress um so again this really shows the importance of marriage in uh, a victorian woman's life mm -hmm. and the importance that was given to becoming a wife and a mother and indeed one of my quotes here again and i'm very happy to have a lot of quotes from the period so it's not me saying how important these things were was um, from Melva Home Whispers to Husbands and, and Wives from 1859 and it says to fail of love, honor, peace and happiness in her domestic relationships is with most women to make a failure of life. <laughs> Therefore, marriage is to her a great event, the great event of her life. 
Well, these quotes are just, it's wonderful to tra have us travel back to see what society, and that was how society felt back then. That was the main so it's consensus. To, yeah. Yeah, obviously it was, this is all aspirational mm -hmm. literature. So all the etiquette books and arbiters can say anything, you know, they're, sure. they're saying things. Um, it's not necessarily the truth, but it shows you how society was thinking. And of course there were people who didn't believe this, but this is sort of the main consensus. And one of the other um, quotes that I have here was talking about the importance of a bride's trousseau. Mm -hmm. So let me finish with the bride first. So she has these oversized orange blossoms, which are just incredible. They're, they're really full size, um, so they would have probably been taken from uh, another wedding dress. She's carrying a little handkerchief. The, I have to tell you that the um, veil and the headpiece and the bouquet are reproduction. The, I, I made those um, just to finish well, it off. you did a great job. But, <laughs> but she does have her little diamond ring on, if you can catch that in the, in oh, the light that, there. Yes. Um, and this beautiful trained ivory dress, which again was a status symbol. So, so being able to purchase a dress that was special for a wedding, um, now that white has come in as the fashionable color for brides, um, the expected color for brides, is really, again, a status symbol of how your family lives. But the other status symbol was the bridal trousseau. So at the time, a bride was expected to uh, take with her to her marriage a full set of clothes and household linens and furnishings that would be her family's contribution. And these were often shown off before the wedding. So one of my most amazing quotes um, is from another etiquette book of the time that is, is fairly unbelievable, but they are, have the, um, the gall to say that the infallible rule for a bridal trousseau was that the bride should have 12 dozen of everything. Okay. So 144 should be, I mean, nobody actually did that, but this just shows you how this ostentation and this excess right. was, was really part of the culture of the time. 12 dozen of everything. 12 dozen of the That's infallible rule, yes. So um, Miss French Mary really does personify what girls were expected to become. They were trained um, for really no other career than becoming a wife and a mother. And that was criticized at the time. Um, many are, people did point out that, that um, this really led to this uh, more and more display, especially because in, in America, after the Civil War, there were far more marriageable age women than there were men. So there was a shortage of suitable husbands. So girls who wanted to make a good catch had to compete on the marriage market. Um, so this led to crit criticism that girls were just trained to, uh, to dress well and, and sing and do, you know, be very um, decorative and accomplished, but they didn't really know what, how to mm -hmm. function later in life. So many arbiters um, stressed the importance for women of learning domestic duties, which would be necessary in their future roles. So the next case over here uh, focuses on some of these duties that were seen as really applying to women of the time. So it was said that no matter how exalted her station, a woman should know how the work of a house should be done since that is her express vocation. She could then supervise servants if she was well to do. So it's interesting to see just what the dolls are provided for. They have all these things, workaday dresses. So in addition to the really fancy items, there's this little brown uh, calico dress here that you could wear in the morning when you're um, either working around the house or supervising things, little very beautiful aprons. They have table linen. Miss Fanchon, who has by far the most clothes and accessories, has a monogrammed table linen with her name written on it. Um, they have uh, sheets and, and um, uh, embroidered pillowcases and blankets and so forth. Again, these are all Miss Fanchon's with her F on them. Wonderful. She has... Uh, things to learn how to care for clothes. So you have clothes brushes, you have little sachets with her F again embroidered on them. And then very unusually, two of the dolls have wire clothes hangers. Uh, these were a very new invention. So most women at the time would not have had these clothes hangers. Um, in fact, if you live in Philadelphia and you may have a closet that's not deep enough to have um, in an old house have clothes in it, but would have pegs and you would hang your clothes on the pegs or you could store them flat in a wardrobe. But two of the dolls have clothes hangers kind of as a forerunner of what's to come. That is just amazing. It is so, it is so extraordinary to see these many things because they, they were always lost. Yes. These tiny, tiny, yeah. tiny artifacts. Is this sewing box totally original? 
The box is original, the contents are not original. The, all the fabric has been added, but the, what is original are these little scissors that actually open and close, the tiny needle case, although the needles were not there, those were added in, the little thimble, and then a stiletto, which was used to punch holes, two stilettos, to punch holes into uh, fabric and to, could be embroidered around for embroidery on glaze, which was a very fashionable style of Amazing. embroidery. So it really does show this importance of sewing. And again, one of my favorite quotes um, really speaks to that as well. It's on the wall here. It says, um, in part, a woman who does not know how to sew is as deficient in her education as a man who cannot write. <laughs> so it really does put this in, in perspective, just how important yes. learning how to sew was for, Absolutely. for girls. And then some of the uh, garments are, are obviously homemade. We have these little knit, um, heavier knit stockings. The Chatelaine here, um, there, there are two. This was really a symbol of the housewife, very traditional from the uh, Middle Ages on, that would tuck into a, a belt or a skirt and, and carry, um, well here it's got a watch on, but it could also have household um, keys and that kind of thing, the symbol of a housewife. One of the dolls even comes with her own little tiny bisque baby, really a token of what her He's future jarly. will be. Yes, <laughs> we love those little all bisque babies. <laughs> Especially with the molded bonnet like yeah, that, yeah. really rare. And then um, another aspect of a woman's life was keeping up correspondence, both personal and um, business correspondence. So this beautiful little French-made papeterie, which it says on the front, comes complete with um, a pen, a two ink wells, a little stamp. There's a letter opener and this beautiful stationery, both um, gilded edge and then the, the ones with the little charming animals on both the um, the writing paper and the envelopes themselves. Wonderful. And of course, learning how to wash clothes, as I said, was something else that girls could do. Here I've made a, a washing line to, to show off some more of the underwear um, yes. and get vertical in the it's case as well. It's a very interactive <laughs> way to display them too. I think it's fantastic. You've done an incredible job just with the technical aspect of putting this together and these beautiful graphics. That, that you have throughout the display too. They're just Thank lovely you. and wonderful. Yeah. yeah, these are, it's nice to have some fashion plates showing the full yeah. scale. So you can really relate the clothes that you're seeing for, made for the dolls to, again, these, these fashion plates. Absolutely, uh, and there's the little girl playing with her doll. Where did you find these? Were these from fashion books? Uh, magazines? Th these are from fashion plates that mm -hmm. I've either uh, sure. a few we had in the museum or I've purchased a few more um, that yes. were specific uh, to this It's uh, just time. extraordinary. Look at this, everybody. It's as if you were here. Okay, so um, each one of these vignettes has a different theme, which we mm -hmm. absolutely love. This one says home culture. Yes, so, so in addition to knowing how the house should be run, um, technical details, it was really considered to be a woman's job to bring the refinements of music and literature to her family to make sure that everybody um, was morally uplifted and so forth. And indeed, another one of my favorite quotes, and I have a lot, was that without women, men would soon revert to the savage state. So it was definitely incumbent well, upon a woman. Of, I kind of agree with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I'm have to agree with that one So in addition to bit. that, you have um, the dolls have oh, little tiny sheet music here they have playing cards they have all kinds of books and so forth little bibles um all of these things that would reflect the fact that they're they're um very civilized and refined in their home life um, and many different outfits of course too um the the little wrapper which you could wear in the morning this this was a very fashionable um garment and all of the dolls have them with the especially with this um printed contrast banding and and the Especially printed um, to that. put these together. Um, the little fan, which Fans was thrown incredible. in, I'm sure this was a, probably sent out at Christmas time, um, but a little girl has thought it was just the perfect size and thrown yes. it in with the dolls. The miniature books were probably not made for the dolls because there was a whole um, miniature book market, but they certainly are the right size, so the young owners have added. This one is a particular favorite, this green one here that I have open to a page showing an illustration of the happy family. It's called the Angel of the Fireside, and that was a, a Victorian term for what women should be is this, you know, this very angelic ideal of of the ideal woman of the um, mid um, 19th century. Amazing. The little pince nez are, are charming too, so she can can read um, and, and study things. And then ag again, 
I'm sure made for advertising purposes, publicity purposes, this miniature version of the Boston Evening Transcript from July 1st, 1847, which is the perfect size for a doll as well. Sure Little is. Bibles of various kinds and more sewing implements because again, it wasn't just um, practical sewing that women needed to do. One of the things that was really strong was women should be doing something at all times. If you make decorative needlework, mm -hmm. you're always busy, which is good because women should be industrious, but you're not actually producing anything. So several other examples of crocheted uh, pieces from um, two different kinds of jackets and then the little headscarf or fanchon and the little wrist warmers that were all probably made uh, by uh, either the girl herself or one of her relatives. Then there, there's a miniature photo album. These little tiny um, gem photographs were very popular in the 1860s and you can see that they're the perfect size uh, for the little doll's photo album. And some of the um, toy makers in Paris even furnished their own little um, cards. So they have an, a name of a toy maker on the back and then the photographs of the dolls on the front. So they're like little miniature carte de visite, which were very fashionable at the time. Wonderful. It's so neat to see these different things from different industries, miniatures, dolls, textiles, all put together in one exhibit. They're kind of drawing from each other. And, and coming up with your, um, with the, telling the story. Yeah, it really is a, you know, as I said, it really shows you the different aspects that women were expected to master and excel in and how the dolls could be so useful in, in exposing a girl to how to dress well, how to put things together, all of the different roles that she should, she would be expected to know and master. So yeah. that's, it's really been, been fun to, to do this. This case, for example, looks at the ladies' dressing table. So again, women were urged that it was their duty to cultivate um, their beauty and that um, they really needed to spend a lot of time um, to ensure that they were beautiful. Uh, so this case looks at the wide variety of things that you could do from hair ornaments to perfumes and rice powder because of course no well-bred women used cosmetics, that was, that was beyond the pale, but you could certainly make sure your nose was not shiny. <laughs> um, and just at the full range, they have a little tiny toothbrush, a little miniature um, alarm clock that has a compass on the back. Uh, several of them have hairpins, combs, ribbons of all different kinds, brushes and so forth, um, all little perfume bottles and mirrors. Uh, again, this little mirror here was probably, came in this little box. It was probably made as a um, advertising gimmick by this New York um, glass manufacturer. Lots of cravat bows. This was a period heavy oh, into accessories. Cravats. So you could have all these bows, oh under gosh. sleeves, uh, a, a collar, little cuff links, pin cushion, um, earrings. Uh, there's a boot hook and a shoehorn, nightgown, night sack or bed jacket and a nightcap. More of these printed um, wrappers, which were sort of the equivalent of dressing gowns, worn here and then worn by Another doll, our newest addition, this is Miss Mary Scott, who came into the collection just a few months before the doll exhibition opened, uh, brought in by the, um, the, uh, the it was uh, belonged to the, uh, the man's uh, grandmother and his wife brought it in and it had been in the family for all this time and we have a lot of history on, on this doll, which is great. So she's wearing a wrapper very much like the other ones as you see. She also came with a little wash Love jug the wash stand, yes. and the little um, washcloth and the little soap in the soap dish. Um, so she really furnished, helped furnish this, um, Wonderful. this case beautifully. This is a beautiful example here, this, yes. this little morning dress. And this is again, another great quote of the time. It was said that the most fatal error a woman can make is to dress out up really nicely when she goes out, but to be a sloven at home. Oh, devastating. She would lose the respect of her husband and family. Oh, I'm sure. So you had, you were <laughs> yes. warned that in the morning before you got formally dressed, you should always take care to look yes. your best. And certainly wearing this elaborate um, morning gown would would, take care with a little cap would, would be an elegant way uh, to be undressed and be around your family and not so let them down and certainly yes. not be a sloven. <laughs> we're going to get right behind here so that our viewers can see this. Look at this uh, virtual conventioneers. This is just extraordinary. This has got to be one of the most elaborate and beautiful uh, nightgowns that I have ever, or day gowns. It's a, yeah, how, it's like house a morning dress. dress. It's morning like dress. Something you would wear around the house seen. in the morning. Yeah. Yes. Just extraordinary. And you can see the other hangers on the back. Um, we've created the, the, um, 
thing to hang them on, but the hangers themselves are original uh, as well. So again, uh, the dolls are really ahead of their time in many ways. That's amazing. We're just giving a little pan here as we cruise through this incredible exhibit with Christina here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the little ladies exhibit. This is such a treat for us. Now we are transitioning into social duties. Yes, this was another area where women really had to take the lead. It was up to them to uphold familial respectability and keep up the social ties. So a great part of fashionable women's life was devoted to paying calls. Every woman would have a day or a set period of time when she would receive visitors, and then the other time she would go and pay calls on someone else. And there were very strict rules about this. Um, so you had your visiting cards, which the dolls um, many of them have, and you would take your visiting cards and there were strict rules for the etiquette of calling. You stayed very briefly, you left your card. If you were married, you left your husband's card. If the other one was married, you could turn down different corners, whether you pay, came in person or if you were going away. All of these rules that you had to learn. Um, one of the um, etiquette books of the time really said that visiting cards were the alpha and omega of their society. They were like just the primary thing. So women really kept these social um, ties up. And you can see how beautiful these cards are. Miss Fenchon here, who um, came to us in 1922 and has by far the most clothes and accessories of any of the dolls, is holding her visiting card. And then on the, on the um, deck in front of her are one from G. Townsend and others from um, Miss French Mary. And then the, these little cards are from the new doll, Mary Scott. And someone has gone to the trouble of hand painting all those little different flowers on some of her visiting cards cards with wow. the little pencil oh, and the look Scott at that. on them. That's incredible. And just so you guys can see out there, there there's my finger. <laughs> That's how you can see just how tiny these things are. Just incredible. Yeah, Sometimes really, on screen you can't really gauge how, just true. how tiny these but things are. But keeping track of all these tiny things has really been a, a yes. major challenge because, um, sure. you know, we, when we were installing they had to come across the street because our department and storage is across the street so we have been very meticulous with working with the registrars to transport all of these safely and keep track of them all so women also of course had to know all the other social things so we have this evening dresses it's, it's really for. quite incredible sort of in, almost a bumblebee like in, oh, in it's color just, isn't it's it? just extraordinary and beautiful uh, lace up the back with this little um uh, just joke. lace, yeah. just lace yeah. Yeah. in itself is such a craft. Yes. There are de museums dedicated just to lace. Absolutely. This is just phenomenal. And the little lace um, jacket is, is oh, beautifully it's just, made too. Yeah, it's just incredible. Yeah. And then they have lorgnettes and tiaras. So you could, of course, um, the most, all of the different nuances of dress were very important. So everything from walking dress, which was did not have a train, to carriage dress, which did have a train for day wear. Then you had your um, day dresses, dinner dresses, and so forth. And then your evening dresses. And the most elaborate type of dress, it was said, was um, for opera dress because you would go to the opera not only to see, but to be seen. And if you think of those yes. opera houses like the one here in Philadelphia that have the horseshoe shape, everybody sat in the boxes and looked across with their lorgnettes or opera glasses to see what other people were wearing, who they were talking to. So it was a whole, it wasn't just you go and sit in the dark, you go and everybody's looking at you and seeing what you're wearing and, and who you're talking to. So right. that was the most formal dress it was said. Um, just amazing of the bonnets and, and um, hats that the dolls have are also quite extraordinary. You can see some of the detail there. And of course, no um, well-bred woman would go out of the house without uh, the proper headgear. Oh, of course not. And then you can see too that they have these parasols, which are beautiful. They actually carry them as Miss Ranchon is by this little ring at the top, um, rather than carrying them by the handle as we think of, of carrying a, a parasol or an umbrella today. So uh, they have the, the ring at the top. This little feather tippet is also quite extraordinary for the way the feathers are matched and it really forms this little collar. And another one of my favorite pieces of jewelry, that little pin shaped like a bow. I forgot to point out oh, the, look, the bug a, pin in the crown. front. It's, it's, and again, yes. all the dolls have uh, pocket watches. They were very, very fashionable for women. So you at guys the time. can see, there's my finger size. <laughs> it's, it's, these are tiny, tiny, tiny. A lot of our viewers understand miniatures, yeah. but, but um, <laughs> are all of these uh, outfits for Miss Fashion? No. Okay. The dolls have been very generous and they lay in, lent each other their clothes and accessories. Okay. Because there were so many different sure. things, and I was really emphasizing the thematic, um, we didn't keep them by who has what, but they're, they're very friendly and uh, share. Yes, like they sister. share. 
they're their closets. <laughs> so I, I do want to point out uh, both the, the little golden slippers that came in with the new doll. They're in beautiful condition. Gorgeous. I was so happy to see those. And then the other really interesting feature is the black dress right behind them. Um, for morning wear. So, of course, the dolls, have, there is a wedding dress, but they also have dresses for mourning. Yes. And this, again, is a really felt to women to uphold familial respectability when a family member dies. So a man, if a family member died, might wear a black armband for a short period of time, but women followed a far stricter code of etiquette for mourning dress. So there were three stages of mourning. Um, full mourning, which was um, no shiny fabrics, typically crepe and no um, glittery ornaments. Second morning, and this dress is a second morning example because the fabric is shiny and it has the jet beads on it. And then finally, uh, light morning, which you could introduce a white and purple and gray. So there are these three stages. Oh, wow. And so there were set rules and arbiters different slightly, but the generally accepted was, uh, for example, a widow would typically wear mourning for two years in a day. So a year of full mourning, six months of light uh, second morning and then light morning uh, but of course some women started to wear morning and never went out of it like queen victoria and then the rules for every other relative and so forth were um also laid out so for a grandparent it was this long for an aunt and of course you wore it also for your husband's relatives so it was really um very much about um not only showing respect um for your relatives, but also it was a social symbol because it was very expensive to buy all black fabric and Absolutely. it was considered unlucky to keep crepe in the house in between periods of mourning. So this was a way that, again, that women really showed the family's position in society. We just learned so much about mourning and, and I honestly think if you haven't done a program on that, you could because it is a very fascinating subject. Uh, mourning jewelry and mourning clothes Absolutely. and mourning everything. Yeah. People really do gravitate towards that. It's and very I think again, it's a it's a difference. Um, just like the ideal uh, of the female figure, it's a difference because to the Victorians, um, you know, we might think hair jewelry is a bit macabre, and mm -hmm. some of their practices seem uh, uh, very odd to us. But but they, you know, that was a different way of dealing with death. Now our society is almost afraid to even talk about it very often. Times so, right. of course with um, mortality rates being what they were, especially infant mortality and so forth, it was a fact of life for a lot of Victorians, unfortunately. Absolutely, absolutely. Again, your graphics are just extraordinary. They're so, so, so beautiful. Thank you. What do you do with them after the exhibit comes down? Um, these were applied right to the wall. So, oh, yeah. oh, wow. Yeah. How neat. They so were... you'll just paint over them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the wall will probably come yeah. out and change slightly. But no, these are from fashion place that we have here at the museum. And we took high resolution photographs and then um, did uh, just Photoshop out the imperfections. But, That's but just they, phenomenal. They really made a great, um, I wanted something that was bigger and brighter in here to kind of lighten it up and they certainly show this range of fashion oh um, sure we so, so our viewers appreciate so much just the um, the sheer amount of work that went into from everything that you did building walls creating <laughs> graphics it's i know it's normal for you guys but for us to see it and appreciate it is just incredible well luckily we had um we had already pre-made these little like the hat stands these i i had made when i did a smaller version of this installation a while ago these are banisters from doll's houses that i bought oh and great them into idea. little hat stands and what the, a great the idea. other ones are the, the dress stands are also uh, little spindles that oh, became I love it. little forms so this case is called In Transit, and it looks at, at two different things. One, uh, what was necessary for traveling in Victorian times. Of course, it was, I mean, just getting on a plane now, even for eight hours, is a long, you know, very laborious and so forth. But of course, when before that, you had, it was dusty, it was hot, it was terrible. So women would prepare themselves. Um, they could carry these rugs, and they all, a, a number of the dolls have these traveling rugs, and shawls, um, several have these beautiful shawls, and shawl straps. So you could roll up a shawl or a blanket and carry it along with you, kind of like yoga mats are today, which I think is a very practical uh, thing to have. They also have other things for dealing with the cold. This, this hooded uh, little cape here um, would be very practical. The little rubber overshoes, which are just Look beautiful. Look tiny. Those little muff here, a little um, uh, fur tippet, again, imitating ermine. Uh, so, and the little belt bag, which again is a very practical invention. And the coins. Yeah, and it has little um, coins with a, some kind of Arabic language on them that obviously were just the right size to fit into that little, um, little ha tiny handbag. So it looks at that aspect of traveling, but it also looks at um, changing horizons for women. So 
by the late uh, 1860s and 1870s, um, sports were starting to become a little more popular for women, and women were being seen more in society. With improvements in communication and travel, women were going out in public. So I'm very pleased that we have these two little tiny historioscope cards. You can see the Philadelphia Makers Mark, Mason and Company Philadelphia, on oh, the little that. case they How came fun. in. This was a magic lantern show, so you could go out and be entertained in the pre-movie and television days by having this magic lantern um, slideshow. And then, they have uh, one of them, Miss Fanchon has these wonderful little roller skates um, that are just so darling. Oh, we they love really those. show um, changes to come in the ideal for women. And the 1860s, archery was becoming popular and also skating was popular. In the 1870s, they started to have other sports added. Of course, they also played croquet, as anyone familiar with Winslow Homer's works know. And then more and more sports will come in. Uh, archery, uh, sorry, tennis in the 1880s and bicycling in, in the 1890s. And that really opens women's um, role up. So the ideal for women is starting to change. And by the late 19th century, this very um, uh, sort of uh, angelic, um, almost China doll, for want of a better word, kind of ideal will start to change more towards the Gibson girl, a stronger, more athletic figure. But I think it's really mm -hmm. interesting that the dolls have roller skates. And I do have on the um, a, a reproduction here of something from Harper's Bazaar from 1876 showing women and children roller skating. And you can certainly see that uh, although they are now participating in sports here, their clothes make very few concessions to this physical activity. Right. They're still wearing long skirts and bustles and all of the other accoutrements of fashion. But it hints that their things are about to change in the ideal because uh, the feminine ideal uh, doesn't stay static. It does continue to evolve. The quotes that you have here are just so wonderful they're just so it's it's interesting to see what what they were saying in in the 1870s the ugly girl papers or hints for the toilet i mean <laughs> it's just it's just remarkable yeah i was really pleased to be able to use so many quotes and yes because it's one thing for me just you know somebody just to say this is what they said or thought but when you quote the people yeah, from the time it's real it you can see and although it, you know, everybody has their own opinion, of and course. this wasn't representative of the whole of society. This was a general consensus about yeah. what the proper women should do and be. Yes. Oh, it's it's very it's it's wonderful for us to see, and a lot of people in the doll and and industry um, know this and know how it was, and it's part of why we love it too. That's right. It's just. Look so then we move into a little interpretive room um, where we have a couple cases that people can look at just um, and think about other aspects. This one asks the question, uh, they're all about the feminine ideal. Do little things mean a lot? And so we have a variety of accessories, um, both professionally made, like the bonnet and the cards and the gloves, another pair of gloves, um, and homemade accessories. So pointing out really the, that every girl sort of made a story about her doll, but unlike say an American girl doll from today, they don't come with a backstory. So you could make your own story, you could add to it. Someone has laboriously made this little paper money here, um, you know, writing the different amounts and, and making a little paper coin even as well. Awesome. And wow. we also, ha I have a reproduction of the front of a pattern envelope for a draw doll's trousseau so a little girl could make clothes for her doll herself and be sure she was really up to date in all her fashions. So it wasn't just buying these things, it was also very interactive. The next one looks at the perfect body type um, and why the Victorians really thought that the, the hoop skirt and the bustle were the ideal for women. So um, you have another of the doll's little bustles here and then this is a reproduction of a page from a Wanamaker catalog from 1889-90 showing a variety of bustles and a photograph of, of a woman in the very extreme wow. bustle. But one of my favorite things is this illustration from uh, Thomas E. Hill's album of biography and art from 1881. So if you see, there's two figures. The one that's with the broad shoulders and the slim hips is labeled wrong, lack of symmetry. <laughs> Men should have the broad shoulders and slim hips. The one that's labeled right, well proportioned, has sloping shoulders and then this expanse of fabric and decoration uh, around the hips, really well, making this big contrast between um, men and women. Thank goodness they gave us the picture, so we would, <laughs> so we would know what to do. We would know but what it's right fascinating. And I love it. <laughs> Um, then we ask a, a little bit more, whose ideal is it anyway? And then that again brings in the fact that not everyone 
bought into the I ideal that society held um, that women should be seen and not heard, should only be concerned with home and family. So these trade cards um, talk about uh, Nellie Bly, the investigative reporter who went around the world in 1889 and set a new record for the fastest trip. Um, she was one who would have grown up at the time that dolls were being played with. Um, and as this um, blow up of one of the cars said, she made the startled world confess men don't monopolize success. So certainly she was one who sort of broke the established yes. rules about what a woman could do. And I was very pleased that the new doll that we have, uh, that we just got into the collection, we have a lot of history about who owned it. And the woman who owned it went on to become a doctor. She went to Smith College and then she became a doctor in the 1890s. She moved with her husband out to Tacoma, Washington. He was very prosperous, but then went bankrupt. And she went back to work as a um, pharmacist to support the family. So again, not what was expected necessarily for the girls who were playing with these dolls. Right. Oh, we love it. Mm -hmm. And then this is just such a wonderful way to just bring it all together with what we're, what we're experiencing today. This 1999 Barbie, working woman Barbie. Yes, yeah, she has everything a working woman from the time she'd need. Her copy of Working Women magazine, her little laptop, a coffee mug, a little cell phone somewhere, um, and all of the things that, that uh, she should have. But the interesting part is, and it's shown on the back of the package reproduced here as well, that she can can take that same skirt and turn it inside out and it becomes a glittery skirt and then she has shoes she can change into so she's ready to go you out go, dancing girl. with Ken afterwards. You go girl. So again, yes. this, these two very different roles for women to have. But it really shows, yeah. um, and the reason I included it was it really shows that we still have toys that um, allow children to imitate grown-ups. They want to see what grown-ups are doing. You know, now children have toy cell phones because where do what do adults do all the day? They look at their cell phones and talk on their cell phones. So imitating um, some of the things that you see grown-ups do is really a way that children learn. And although these dolls, the fashion dolls, weren't meant as instructional tools, they definitely functioned that way because just playing with one and changing this outfit and, and matching up different accessories and deciding, oh, she's going to a ball, what is she going to wear? Mm -hmm. You know, all of these things would have taught the girls of the time, the privileged girls who could play with these, um, what it was like to be the ideal fashionable lady. Yes, and I love um, what you said about play uh, up here, and, and we all know how essential play is to de development, and it's especially uh, important for, uh, from a doll collector's perspective, dolls for us and being able to change the clothes and, and get into that uh, space of imagination, it, it's a very safe place for us. Mm -hmm. And to have a safe place to play and um, enjoy something is, is just so so essential, Absolutely. I really feel like. Yeah. Well, it is. And, and that's the pr a yeah. primary way that children really learn. So the, the girls who played with these dolls would have, you know, imbibed all of these lessons about what their life was meant to be like even if they later chose not to go that route they they were really learning some of what the societal ideals were absolutely and so at the end of this exhibit uh, you encourage interaction and play by setting up this wonderful station which adults and children can design their own little fashion Yes, or make your own miniature Pieces. accessory. You can yes. you can draw, and it's been very popular. The education has said to take change the the. Um take down many of the little things because it gets filled up so quickly. So it's great. I think people really like to have some some kind of thing that they can do and make their own thing. Obviously, some people want to take theirs home, but other people want to display it. And, display it and enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, it's really great to see when, when the gallery is open, just how many people are taking advantage of that. Well, Christina, it, it is such a big deal for the Virtual Doll Convention to be here. And you the people in, we're hoping over 100 countries are going to be seeing this by the time it airs. Thank you so much for bringing us here. It's it's just incredible. I'm so glad you were able to come, oh, and I hope more been, people will get to enjoy it. They will. They will absolutely enjoy it. So, Christina, what is on the pipeline for you and your next muse, um, exhibit that you're setting up here? Well, I'm not working on another big exhibition for a while, I'm happy to say. Of course, next week we have to take both the exhibitions down, this yes. one in fabulous fashion, so that'll be very busy, and then many other uh, jobs uh, as a curator, inter interpretation and collection related things that I haven't really had time to attend to recently. Good, well hopefully <laughs> you'll get to take a breather and get back to what you uh, enjoy doing a lot of the time. And the Philadelphia Museum of Art is open year round. I think you, you're close on uh, set. Monday. But just Mondays. Just Mondays. Just Mondays mm -hmm. when we're here. So Right, and we're open late a couple nights a week. So I encourage people to come in and uh, visit if they get a chance. Absolutely, thank you so, so much. We appreciate it.
Bye-bye. Great pleasure.